What I want to get to now is really the cost structure advantages that these things bring about and what we really look for as we think about businesses. So Rebel Foods, which many of you know as Fasos from earlier, basically changed the entire cost structure of the QSR business. And I think that when we think about markets and we think about opportunities, these are what I mean by cost structures. I'm being very specific here because I want to go through explaining why we say yes or no to certain opportunities and what we're really hoping to find in them. In the traditional restaurant world, one kitchen meant one brand. That one kitchen, one brand meant that you spent a lot of time and money trying to figure out where to locate it, trying to figure out what product would sell, and from that, you would either be right or wrong. Actually, as a matter of fact, 65% of restaurants shut within one year, and 85% shut within five years. So it's a model that becomes very difficult to continue to scale up and very expensive as a result. What Rebel did was they said, all right, I've got a kitchen. No one's walking into it. Your problem with going to McDonald's and asking for Chinese food is you don't really believe McDonald's will make good Chinese food. So you're never going to do it. So as much as McDonald's wants to get into the salad business, they have a hurdle to overcome. For Rebel, nobody's walking into our kitchen. As a result, we can make whatever we want from that kitchen. And that's exactly what the team did. They went into biryani, they went into Chinese food, they went into pizza, they went to continental cuisine. And what that allowed us to do was over time, costs run like this at the rate of inflation. So if costs are gonna continue to go up, your raw materials, your labor, a business in the restaurant space usually takes an S curve. It takes a while to build, it flattens, and then it goes up and then it flattens again. Sorry, it rises and then it flattens again. By having one infrastructure, and adding multiple brands, you're riding multiple S-curves. This means this can go in perpetuity. J.D. Bisky designed the business to last for 300 years. None of us will know whether we're, what that works or not, but uh, I, I'm hopeful that it will be the case. It's played out. He's proven it. Beirut, in a span of 18 months, with under $2 million in spend, has grown to about an $18 million annualized revenue business. That $2 million is marketing spend. Zero capex, zero risk. That's a structural cost advantage. That's something no existing QSR business can do, and that's something that gives us a ton of value going forward. We're taking that same idea, and he just announced, uh, I think two, three days ago, the, the, the launch pad. And so the idea is people have food missions, and the food missions really are around either family and friends and colleagues, single serve meals, either value or indulgence, and we're not going to create all of them. And this is really now platformizing the business. They launched a $15 million fund to actually fund entrepreneurs to do this. And I think that's another massive change in what the cost structure is going to be for new businesses in this industry. <clears throat> I talked a little bit about personalization before as well. What we did here in Imbibe's case, and again, a structural advantage that we looked at, we were able to take our technology platform, ingest data, be very good at mapping this to different concepts. So if you are learning physics, it's not enough to tell you do more physics questions and you'll do better. When you get question 2, 14, and 23 wrong, we tell you that you messed up in the, a concept of force or acceleration. And I think that was key to be able to create a system that could automatically ingest that content, tag it, and then give people question papers and then direct them in the way that made sense. A traditional business, a traditional tuition program has businesses with limited reach, they have high rental costs to set up, and we have a shortfall of talent in terms of teachers. Actually, talent in many areas, healthcare, teachers, doctors, all of this are problems that exist. Platforms change that game entirely. And that's what we were able to do here. By personalizing and leveraging AI, we were actually able to create a system that was free of those. <clears throat> Similar in concept is Flinto. And the idea that we have a 20 million kids born every year, I just talked about the teacher deficit that exists. People set up preschools in their living rooms and call people home and say, we'll run a preschool. Now, that's fine, and that's a good way to occupy your child. But ultimately, people are now recognizing, again, with the advent of content and information, the importance of early learning. So as that becomes more prevalent, they're going to search for schooling that's actually of a high quality. With the Flinto platform, what started with a basic box delivered to somebody at home to engage the child more effectively than random toys or iPads or devices, um, moved into a system that actually allows us to put a school up anywhere. We created Flinto Class as a product. 
this brings again the same structural advantage. We're giving you a structured curriculum at low cost, delivered to you monthly for each of the students in your, in your, uh, in your living room, so if it were, or under a tree, as, uh, as I think um, Arun has talked about here. That's a massive change in the cost structure of what it takes to actually set up a preschool. Droom fundamentally made information available and changed the cost of selling a car. A, a used car purchase process typically involves lots of difficult steps along the way. Many people call you if you're selling a car, you're trying to figure out who's real, who's not real. You then have a sub-dealer network because as a dealer, you actually don't have uh, enough working capital to keep rotating cars, so you're trying to move the car as fast as possible. You'll call a friend, you'll tell them, look, if you do it, I'll give you a commission. Um, you'll put ads in various sites that are driven just to create awareness. All of this adds up to about 10% of the value of the vehicle. And that 10% of the value of the vehicle doesn't come, also, by the way, comes with a massive time sink, which is not calculated in that. What Droom said is, I'm going to change the equation here. I'm going to create a platform that allows all the information to exist. I'm going to provide you the history of the vehicle. I'm going to provide you uh, the, the state of the vehicle with, uh, with mechanics that actually certify it. I'm going to give you pricing in the market so that you know what's happening. What that does is allows this one seller and one buyer to automatically connect on one platform and have a cost of only 2% of the vehicle. Now, we can take this up a little bit here and there, but ultimately, if I look at it, 10% versus 2%. Massive structural change in the way the industry works. I alluded to this before with Melora, but it's uh, one of those that I think has really surprised us and, and, and opened us up to a lot of other areas. If you look at it, the Nishk as a business, this is their model. Walk into a physical jeweler. Sit there, look at the item. Decide what you like. Buy it and leave. This is massive working capital. This is massive impediment to scaling into geographies. They are in 127 cities um, after about 25 years of, of operation. We have already shipped to 600 locations in the country. We have zero inventory. What that means is we can iterate and roll out more designs on a regular basis much faster than anybody else. And as I talk about fashion in a minute, you'll understand the importance of that. We have on 0.3% of the revenue, greater margins than the Nishk. That's insane. We've changed the entire dynamic of how jewelry can be thought about. It is now a fashion product, not an investment product, where you think about making charges as how you look at it. So that's a shift in the cost structure of the industry.